Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening. I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to tonight's Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations program. Our guest is John Rogers, Senior Analyst for the Union of Concerned Scientists Climate and Energy Program and co-manager of the UCS Energy Water Initiative. John Rogers received his BA from Princeton University and his master's degree in mechanical engineering at the University of Michigan. He served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Honduras and later applied his technical skills and social commitment to clean energy initiatives, one of which was as a co-founder of the company Solyuz, uh, a leading developer of clean energy technologies for rural communities. Mr. Rogers formally managed the Northeast Clean Energy Project and the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. He serves on the board of directors of the U.S. Offshore Wind Collaborative and of RENEW, that's an acronym, an organization that promotes renewable energy in New England. He also serves on the advisory boards of several nonprofit organizations promoting renewable energy and global energy access. While most of us are aware of the looming global freshwater crisis, we're less aware, perhaps, of the disproportionate amount of water used in the production of electricity. John Rogers is here tonight to explain the situation in the United States in particular, the regional impact on freshwater resources by electric plants, the generating systems themselves, and the possible solutions to the problem, including energy saving and renewable energy options. It is a great pleasure to welcome John Rogers, a leading expert on freshwater and energy use and a representative of the Union of Concerned Scientists, which I hope everybody will join, one of the best organizations out there anywhere for providing quality information to the public. Welcome, John Rogers. Thank you very much, Yvonne. And we want to start right in by uh, saying something about the amount of fresh water. Can you tell us, like, do we have heaps of it? The planet is 80% water or something. Where's the fresh water? That's, that's a great question. We all know that, that uh, we are the water planet. We, we have tremendous water here on, on Earth. Uh, most of it is salt water, 97.5% mm -hmm. of it is salt water. Most of what's left is locked up, is either locked up in ice caps mm. or is too far underground for us to extract or is soil moisture. That leaves a very small percent, less than 1% of that fresh water that's actually available to us and gets replenished on a regular basis. And this is getting used up uh, tremendously, correct? Is there are that, a lot uh, of, that's right. There are a lot of pressures on it uh, in terms of quantity and in terms of quality. Okay, then you are focused especially on the problem in the United States. And as I said, we seem to know a lot about agricultural use of fresh water, but less so on this. What is, uh, first of all, the, the general regional issue in the United States as far as fresh water goes? So obviously, if you look at the country, we're, we're a big country. We have very different uh, situations with regard to mm -hmm. water. So if you look at water rich areas like the Northeast uh, or the Northwest, they're, they're uh, dealing with certain issues. If you look at water, uh, water challenged areas like the Southwest and even surprisingly parts of the Southeast and the Midwest, they have other issues, uh, including when it comes to power plants, which we'll talk okay, about Okay, yes, and so then going straight to this business of the power plants then, could you tell us how is the fresh water used in the power plants? Sure, uh, so first let me get, get a sense, of, let me give you a sense of the scale, yeah, and then, then right. we'll talk about why. So if we could have that first slide. Right. So if you think about water withdrawals in the U.S., fresh water, so mm -hmm. forget seawater for a moment, but if you think about fresh water withdrawals, it turns out 
that the largest share of that pie, as large as agriculture, the, for withdrawals is power plants. Yeah, that's... When you're talking about how much of that actually gets evaporated or consumed, uh, most uh, the power plants put most of that back. So, uh, so agriculture is the largest consumer of water. But this is a pretty startling figure. And I'll say I mm -hmm. was working in the power sector for close to 20 years and I was not clued into this. Uh, this was uh, That's a relief that to hear because most of us are not aware of it's it. It's a whole nother aspect. I think a lot, and you know, in my work, I've done a lot with thinking about carbon and thinking mm -hmm. about economics right, right. and thinking about uh, other pollutants, uh, but then to have this water dimension, it really adds a whole nother flavor to the discussions yeah. around power plants and electricity and choices. Well, before you explain how it works, um, the president gave a speech today, correct, on the business of power plants, I, I think, but was that just the CO2 emissions? Did he mention any of this, for example, about the use of the of water? Sure, the power plant speech, to, uh, the, the uh, president's speech today did talk about power plants. It was about climate change, so power plants are a huge piece of that. And uh, he talked a lot about existing power plants and coal plants. He also talked about renewable, mm -hmm. renewable energy like wind and solar uh, and energy efficiency. And those are all important pieces of thinking about not just the problem, but also the solution when mm -hmm. it comes mm -hmm. to water, the water implications of our energy choices. But there's also this dimension of climate change and its impact on our water resources. So it, thinking it, about uh, future water supply, water availability, right thinking about water temperature, water quality, yeah. and what that means. And and so then, climate change obviously has huge impacts on water, while power plants have huge impacts on both climate change and water. And environment and everything and else. Uh, right, That's which right. I guess you explain in the mechanics of this. Could you take us through uh, how the circulation issue in the, which is what we never hear much about, uh, very little about, um, uh, how the fresh water is used in the in the power plants themselves, sure. and that is this once through and recirculating and, and so on. That's right, so okay. just to start with the, the mechanics. Thank you. Most of the electricity in the United States is generated is made by generating steam. So you, you heat something, you burn mm -hmm. coal or natural gas, or you have a nuclear reaction, or you use the sun's heat or the earth's heat to make steam. That steam then drives a turbine, that makes our electricity. That's all, that's all fine. Uh, it's the next step when it comes to water, it's the cooling that steam. That's a key part of the process. So if you could look at the slide here, it's not this part, that's, that's a closed cycle where uh -huh, you have uh -huh. steam being produced and uh -huh, then being uh -huh. condensed back into water. It's what happens to condense it back into water. Mm -hmm. That's where water, that's where all this water, these water withdrawals, this water consumption mm -hmm. comes into play. So there are uh, two basic types of power plants, two basic types of cooling systems. Many power plants use what's called once through cooling, where they're withdrawing large amounts of water Mm -hmm. using it once, as the name mm -hmm. implies, and then putting it back. They're putting it back hotter, mm -hmm. sometimes with other, other uh, uh, pollutants in it, but they're putting it back hotter because its purpose is to take heat away right. from this process, this con right. condensing process. They're also recirculating cooling where much less water is withdrawn, but almost all of it or all of it is consumed in the process, evaporated in the mm -hmm. process. So mm -hmm. that's how they're getting rid of the heat. Mm -hmm. They're evaporating it. So each of those has advantages and disadvantages. Right. There's also, I'll just mention, dry cooling, which is where we use air instead of water to cool. So each of those, as I say, has advantages and disadvantages. Once through is the cheapest. You know, it's got the mm -hmm. least mm -hmm. uh, capital invested in it, but it involves, again, withdrawing huge amounts of water. You know, a power plant could be withdrawing 500 million, a billion gallons of fresh water a day that's one power plant. That's one power plant. Uh, but again, it puts most of it back. But it's withdrawing lots yeah. of, uh, you know, it could be fish or eggs or larvae in right. with it. Yeah. And when it put it, when it's putting it back, it is much warmer, and that has a potential impact. Right. On Would the water. you expand on that business of what happens when it's much warmer going back? And I think in some of your material, you have also explained that um, when it's very hot. Uh, the weather is very hot. The water coming in is warmer also. That's and right. It's going and we, out warmer. And, and let's so come on. back to that issue of, okay. about uh, 
collisions, what yeah, happens, yes, why, why yes. this is an issue. But the recirculating plants, so they involve more investment up front because mm -hmm. you've got to build, you know, you think of those cooling towers, that's one way to do it. Mm -hmm. but you associate those with nuclear plants, but those are really just cooling towers for nuclear or coal it could be anything. or other. Okay. Uh, and they also use energy in the cooling process. And mm -hmm. so that's, uh, that's a cost and that's an efficiency cost. So if you're burning coal, you have to burn more coal if you're using that kind of cooling system. The advantage is that you're withdrawing much less water. Mm -hmm. you're, you're consuming a little bit more, but again, there, there are problems associated with those withdrawals. So if we can minimize those, that's an advantage. Now, dry cooling involves more infrastructure, more investment, and more efficiency losses. So there are more. reasons not to like that. That is more energy involved in that. Okay. But if we can get away from using water, that's addressing a lot of the problems that we're seeing with water, the water dependence of power plants. It, does it matter what kind of a power plant then? I mean, if it's nuclear, or if it's coal, we need to just reinforce this. Uh, it doesn't quite matter. They all need cooling. That's right. And they have different, uh, slightly different factors in yeah. terms of how much water they're withdrawing yeah. or consuming. Right. Um, just because of the mechanics, the certain mechanics right. of the plant. And the more efficient plants have less heat that they're trying to get rid of. Yeah. So if it's a newer plant or more efficient, if it's a natural gas, these new efficient yeah. natural gas plants, those are much better from a water, for, in terms of cooling water use. Uh, if it's a, uh, a smaller plant as renewable energy, so picture, yeah. so this isn't just a problem for coal and nuclear and natural gas plants. Right. It can also be a pro if you think about renewable energy sources that actually use the steam process. So, oh. concentrating solar power, yes. geothermal power, uh, biomass, right. all those can use steam processes. So they need to think about cooling their steam. Could as well. you please elaborate a little bit? I don't think most people have heard of concentrated solar power, for instance. Sure. And, and if you could just tell us, because we all think that the alternative energies will be okay, and we're, we're not aware of that they can have problems as well. So think about uh, picture those troughs of mirrors, yes, or those what's called a power tower, yes, with all the mirrors around it. There's one that's about to go online in California that will double our uh, the, the amount of solar thermal or concentrating solar we have in this country, those all concentrate the sun's heat to heat up something that then heats water to make the steam. And then it's just like, you know, it's just driving a turbine, we, you know, the mm -hmm, way we've been mm -hmm, doing it for mm -hmm, more mm -hmm. than a century, making electricity. And again, that needs to have its steam cooled. The difference is that renewable energy facilities are not these, you know, 1,000 megawatts or 2,000 megawatt facilities that we see in coal and nuclear plants. And so you have a better possibility maybe of using air cooling, using uh -huh. that, uh, investing in that so that, you, uh, so that you're not using water. And if you think about where are concentrating, where are we gonna build concentrating solar facilities? We're gonna build them in the desert where mm -hmm. it's hot mm -hmm. and there's mm -hmm. open land. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, having an op approach that doesn't use water can be pretty attractive. Even okay. if it's more expensive, even if it, if yeah. it uh, has involves efficiency losses. Okay, uh, and so there are these renewables that have these other kinds of options and some advantages. There's still a trade-off, though, in terms of this water, and there's great pressure all over the world to get power plants online, and it's a big problem because That's right. they need this uh, amount of water. Um, is now. I understand, you'll have to just tell me if this is correct, that the old power plants, in the, the coal-fired uh, power plants in this country resist things like retrofitting, which might improve the situation. Is this true, and why don't we make these corrections? Why don't we just do it? Why? Well, that's a great question. As we start to think about the solutions, there are ways we can yeah. build new power plants in ways that take water more into account. But we know that the existing, you know, from research we've done, we know that the existing power plant fleet, it, you know, uses a lot of water, withdraws a lot of water, consumes a lot of it, has lots of impacts, gets into trouble because right. of its water use. Right. So there are things that we're going to want to do about our existing power plant fleet. And that's from a from a climate change perspective yes, in terms that, yeah. of carbon, and it's also from a water perspective. Right, so do you see this as inevitable? Something will have to change. People can resist for a while, but basically it's over. You're gonna to have to change here. We certainly believe there are a whole lot of reasons we're gonna to wanna to change, right. and some people will right. uh, 
uh, embrace that change and others will be slow to do so. And will tell us that it cannot be done because it is too expensive. Is it really that expensive when you consider the gains for an in the environment and the efficiency? And well, well, that's a great question. It really depends how much you include in that assessment of cost. Uh, if you think about, you know, we often don't put a price on water. In some parts of the country we right. do, uh, but even there we might not be valuing it as much as we would if we had a complete understanding of the costs of that water, the value of that water for other uses, for, uh, for the pr ecosystem services, so preserving uh, the, the, the fish in the lakes or right. the rivers that we depend on for our, for our economy, for, our, for tourism, say. So part of it is getting the, getting the math right, getting the financial aspects of this right. right and thinking about. So what is the cost of that water? Certainly what is the cost of that carbon? Yes. Uh, and taking that into the calculus. Even before you do that, so there is a transition underway even now in the energy sector, in the electricity sector. We see coal plants, tens of thousands of megawatts of old coal plants that have been announced for retirement, mm. that are headed for retirement. We see lots of new natural gas facilities coming yeah. online, taking advantage of the, the low, you know, the, the dramatic increase in natural gas supply and the drop in the cost of natural gas. And we also see renewable energy going great mm -hmm. guns, you know, coming mm -hmm. online big time, growing to be a larger and larger piece of our energy pie. So there is a transition going on right now in the electricity sector. Right. Now, it seems as though there are times like when in the, uh, the heat of the summer and there's a huge demand in the southwest, for example, for power, for air conditioning and so on, and power co companies have had to shut down, uh, greatly reduce things. Um, do you see this as something that's just going to continue now in the future? And I was thinking in terms of, is this a little pressure to change? Uh, to move toward better that, that's, change? That's a great question. So uh, that's the other thing people need to understand is power plant water use, you know, sort of think about it in terms yeah. of our overall freshwater resources and other pressures on that freshwater. Exactly. The other thing to understand is why we should care. Yeah. And so we, we have documented that. We came out with a report yes. uh, in late 2011 that sort of looked at, at power plant water use, what we know about it, but also why we care, why we should care about that. Right, so that people need to get this, and can they get it, by the way, from Sure, the, this the, is downloadable from, okay. from our website. But the, in this report and other things we've done, what, we, what we've done is document some of, the re, some of the ways you might think about why this matters. Uh, so there, I met, mentioned the issue of, of fish, you know, think about how yes. much, what comes with that water when we're withdrawing, yeah. uh, you know, uh, on the order of 100 billion gallons uh, as a country, you know, power plants as a whole, 100 billion gallons a day. Uh, if you think about what it means to be consuming billions of gallons yeah. of that water, right. you think about the water going back and, and hot, uh, you know, yes. very warm, the impact right. of that on uh, our lakes and rivers right. and the fish that are in them. But even if you don't care about that, think about the power plants themselves. We've got power plants and we document, we've documented many cases of this. Power plants that get into trouble, and chiefly for, for three reasons, uh, because it, given their water dependence. One is that the incoming water is too warm. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't cool. <laughs> so it doesn't cool, so you've got efficiency right. problems, but it also eventually, if you think about a recirculating plant uh, that's cycling that over and over again, you know, using it a few times, uh, it, it eventually gets to a level where it's not safe to operate. This is particularly true for nuclear power plants. And we see this in the Southeast. We see this in the Midwest, see this near the Great Lakes. I mean, power plants getting into trouble because the water is too warm coming in. We also see power plants getting into trouble because the water going out is too hot. Mm -hmm. And this comes back to sort of what we've said about power plants, ab about water discharges in general. We realize that if water is coming in, say above, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, if it's being discharged at greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a problem for the I river. Think, that's yes. a problem for the fish. That, right. that makes it All harder for life. fish to live, right. for life right. in that stream. So those are two of the issues. The third one is that the water might just not be there in the quantities that they need it. That's true. So yeah. the lake levels might be too low, that's the river levels yes. might be too low. Uh, that water might be needed elsewhere. So 
different ways of thinking about this just right. from the power plant perspective. So what happens? Power plants have to, power plant operators have to dial back or shut down a generator mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or two. Uh, we've seen, again, we've seen this over and over again, even last summer, particularly yes, last summer when we had 60% of the country in drought. Uh, we had a lot of people thinking about these issues. So uh, what does that mean? That means that that power plant owner has to go and buy power elsewhere, yeah. or there are blackouts, rolling yes. blackouts or brownouts. Right. So uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the grid is gonna go out, that blackouts will happen if it's a single power plant that we're talking about. But we see examples elsewhere in the world of countries getting into trouble because this happens on a much larger mm -hmm. scale. Mm -hmm. You think about uh, 2003, a, a, a serious heat wave across oh, yeah, across yeah, right. Europe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, France, a country that's heavily dependent on nuclear on power, nuclear. whose nuclear power plants are heavily dependent on water resources, yeah. having to shut back, uh, shut down a number of their plants uh, and have blackouts at a time when you had uh, across the continent tens of thousands of people dying from the heat. Yeah. So we really, you know, just thinking more about this before we get to those situations, thinking about our opportunities, thinking about the choices we have and making water smart choices, we think makes a whole lot of sense. Right, may I take you back just for a minute sure. to this business of the discharge where the water is too warm. Well, two things, bringing it in and it's uh, warm, but it sounded as though it's full of stuff. It's not like you tell the fish to stay home and we're just gonna pull the water out and you guys stay there and we're gonna return the water. It, that's not the issue, things are are coming in, eggs, plants, or whatever, yes? That's right. Okay, and very important bacteria ecologies as well, I'm assuming, so then this gets too hot and it goes back out. It seems to me that that might really be ecologically damaging, is it? Do you know this? Well, uh, sure, we know We know. Uh, you know what, at what temperatures fish start to get into trouble. We okay. know that at higher temperatures there's less dissolved oxygen in the water, yeah. there are issues with that. Um, some fish like the warmer water. You know, if you're catfish, you're probably in better shape. Uh, other fish are very sensitive to okay. temperature and they're fish we might care about. We might care about for ecological reasons. We might care about because they're prized trophy fish for anglers right. who we want to have come to our community, to our river to fish. Right. So there are different issues there. In terms of coming in, there's an issue with what's called entrapment, where fish are getting pinned against the intake screens or entrainment where stuff is getting, whether that's fish or larvae or eggs, getting sucked through the power plants. And you can imagine this is, not, a, right. uh, this is not an amusement park ride. For exactly, the, for the but not only that, but that seems as though it would be an expense for the power plants. You're, you're constantly cleaning things up or whatever. That the other part of that is when you discharge that, you are disrupting hugely the stuff that you pulled in. That, that is these, uh, these little systems, even down to bacteria, you're just scattering it all over the place. So it seems like that should be why Widespread. And it's clear that there are ways of doing each of things, the, each yeah. of these things better, and yeah. ways of doing them worse. You know, if you see older plants, uh, they might have a certain system. They might be able to be upgraded, either in terms of how they're pulling in the water or those screens or, or whatever, or in terms of switching to a cooling tower. Brayton yeah. Point, which is the largest coal plant in New England, right here in Massachusetts, recently built cooling towers. They made a decision, so they were once through cooled. Right. And they made a decision to, uh, not entirely voluntarily, but they eventually built, they have built cooler towers. They invested a whole lot of money in that at a time when coal plants are having a hard time in yeah. terms of the economics just because of natural gas, but they did make those choices. So, you know, you'd want to think long and hard before investing in an old coal plant, investing in that kind of yeah, system. Right whether it might not be better to just shut down that coal plant, repower it with something, replace it with something that's more efficient, right. uh, you, it emits less carbon pollution, and is better from better from a water perspective. Right, I hope you get the message out to the rest of the world we're, too, we're where the demands are, we're certainly you know, it's on very that. hard because people need the cheap energy, but it costs, it's an expense down the line, well, actually. That's right, that's, that's right. So again, you come back to that August afternoon, yeah. we count on there being, you know, when we plug something Absolutely. in, when we're trying to operate our factory, when right. we're in school, we count on the air conditioning wor working, we count on there being lighting. That's right. We count on having power for our computers. If we get to the point where power plants, if we've made choices that don't serve mm -hmm. us well mm -hmm. because of the, the heat wave, because of the drought, 
uh, on that August afternoon, during that July week, during the whole months of July and August. You know, we have examples of power plants, uh, a nuclear power plant that in, in Alabama, in Athens, Alabama, that had 40 days in a row where they had to dial back their power outputs because the Tennessee River was just too hot. Aha, uh -huh. so, and, and down the line, those rivers may not be available in a lot of ways. I mean, right. the, or, the water's just being sucked out. Or other pressures right. are on it. Exactly. Or, so Agriculture, other demands, right. our cities continue to grow Absolutely. in arid parts of the country. Right, and things are going urban all over the world, so that's, that's another right. pressure, isn't it? That's well, right. having cheered everything up here then, okay, then, so we, we have a situation that's rather uh, serious, but it sounds as though there are things that can be done, but we still need to conserve as well. I, I, I imagine that that's another message in there, but give us some solutions then. What do we do in terms of um, solving the problems? What's your take? Well, that's that? the great thing about this, about this whole issue is that there is a lot we can do. Okay. Uh, so if you think about our, our existing uh, first, think about our, our new, as we're building new facilities, whether that's new facilities to meet growing demand, or even better, new facilities to replace existing, existing mm -hmm, power plants. Mm -hmm. There are lots of choices. We can certainly make choices. We can decide not to go with once through cooling. Uh, we, haven't, we don't build once through cooling plants anymore, so that's okay. probably a, a good story, uh, a, a good thing. Uh, we can pick technologies that are more efficient and so they're using less water for cooling. We can pick dry cooling. Again, there mm -hmm. are trade-offs there, and mm -hmm. we want to understand mm -hmm. those, mm -hmm. but there are a whole lot of reasons to think that that's a good way to go for a lot of plants. And then we can pick technologies that get us out of this altogether. On the renewable energy side, so I mentioned the ones that do involve steam yes. for generating electricity. The most, uh, if you think, if you ask people about renewable energy, they're gonna think about wind, yes. and they're gonna think about solar electric. Those right. are two technologies that involve essentially no water. No water and for the production tidal, of electricity. I imagine, where you can have it, right? And then there are certainly up and coming resources that, right. that also get out, of the, get out of that equation. But wind energy, right. a tremendous resource, the yes. number one renewable energy, uh, not counting hydroelectric, right. growing very quickly across the United States, great resources, uh, and no water involved in that. So that's a real good news story. Solar had a tremendous year last year, and it's growing, it has been growing leaps and bounds for years now. Again, a really good news story when it comes to water, yes. the water dependence of our power sector. Just, um, you've worked on this in developing nations and in, uh, in um, uh, rural areas. Uh, is that, I take it that you are committed to that as a really good solution to bringing power, to bringing energy all over the world. That's right, that's that the, right. It, that it's clear solar. that renewable energy has tremendous potential, not just in the United States. Obviously, yeah. we see a lot going on in, in Europe, uh, right. even right. Uh, you know, chi and China leading the way on, yeah. on a lot of these technologies. Yes. Uh, we certainly hope that the U.S., that we can help the U.S. continue to develop not just our resources, but also these technologies and continue right. to help them evolve and improve, uh, improve in their efficiencies, decrease their costs, not just so we can use them in the United States, but also but so that these, these become technologies that we can export, yeah. both for our economic development, right. but also to help countries that are, that are really thinking about how they're going to go into the future uh, you know, in terms of their power system. Yes. And there, we have countries, India and China, that are heavily dependent on coal. Yes. Uh, certainly recognize some of the challenges uh, involved in that. Um, but but see that as their as a uh, as a good path I have seen that as a good pathway forward. Right. We want to be showing how you can do it with renewable energy and do it big time with renewable energy. That is, have these yes. technologies grow and grow and grow to be an ever larger portion of our electricity supply. Right. And there's one other resource mm -hmm. that I should mention. When you think about carbon, when you think about water, when you think about costs, energy efficiency. So actually meeting our needs without generating more electricity uh, is a tremendous is also a tremendous piece of the of the solution equation so thinking about more efficient machines thinking about appliances yeah. in our house yes. thinking about uh, making our houses more efficient so our air conditioning doesn't have to work as hard thinking about our light bulbs the tremendous technologies that are available in each of those areas those have implications for how much carbon we're emitting how much 
uh, money we're spending, but also how much water is being used or isn't being used down, down the line. Uh, up, yeah, up, right. upstream, you know, at the other end of, of the electricity wires. Right, but in terms of where that energy is used, uh, UCS is a uh, union concerned scientist, does a wonderful job of getting out figures and, and uh, uh, advice to people, what people, what we as individuals can do, and so on. But the lion's share of that energy is going to like manufacturing and and buildings that have the lights on all night and all day and so on. That waste is substantial there. Do you see the possibility of changing that problem? In other words, we're being good as consumers, sure. but we need to correct the big users. Sure, that's right. Uh, we focus a lot on, on ourselves as consumers. Right. We don't as ignore individuals. the other. That's right, as individuals and what we're doing in a household. If you think yes. about our own. Carbon, our light bulbs and carbon everything. issue yes. um, and the economics, right. there's a whole lot we can do in our houses. But yes. there's no question businesses can do this, industry can do this. You are seeing a lot of this if you think about businesses taking advantage, advantage of opportunities to have the utility come in or some third party come in and swap out, swap out Great. the lighting. Great. Uh, you know, upgrade the motors that are green being used buildings. in the factory. Yeah. Building, yeah, right, green buildings. So building these, there, there are economies of scale that you get at the factory level or at the commercial building level that we don't get at home. Yes. Uh, so there are advantages, there are actually advantages there. So some yeah. of this is really just communicating it communicating these opportunities to people, both at home and, and at work. Well, and also I imagine that there are two things there, that businesses look good if they present a kind of green image, a, a socially concerned image in that regard. And then do you see a need for regulation in this regard too? Sure, uh, so first off, um, you know, industry, businesses are doing this not just because it mm -hmm. makes them look mm -hmm. good, but because it actually is good for their bottom line. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you see a commitment by Walmart, for example, to cut its electricity use by 20% by this year, uh, they're a, doing a couple good. years yes. ago, they're doing that, you know, obviously they like the positive press they get out of that, but they're also, they are, they I, are I don't know if you've noticed, they're focused on their bottom line yes. pretty mm -hmm. significantly. Right, right, uh, right. And so they're doing this thinking about you know, how can they operate their stores more effectively? Mm -hmm. How can they mm -hmm. uh, eke out better profit margins or cut their prices more? So that's an important piece of right. this. There is a role for regulation. We heard President Obama today in his speech talk about energy efficiency and appliance standards, for example. Some of these standards uh, have evolved more quickly than others, but we've made tremendous strides. If you think about it, if you have a refrigerator that was built before that's 2003, right you're probably, uh, you might want to look for a new refrigerator because right. the technology just keeps getting better right. and better. Uh, that's true for all kinds of things. You think about light bulbs and think yes. about where we are now compared to where we were Absolutely. 10 years ago, even five years ago in right. terms of technology. So those are important pieces of right. this. If you think about the generation side, there's no question that we need to do things better from a carbon perspective. Right. And there are regulations uh, under development. There are people who really get a whole lot of people who, who do get the carbon, mm -hmm. get why we, need, why we need to move toward more, uh, toward lower carbon power sources. Right. So regulation is, is a key part of that. Education is another key yes. part of that. There are utilities, there are power companies that get it, that are making that transition, that mm -hmm. are embracing wind in a big way, or saying solar, you know, really committing to solar, that are shutting down their coal plants. They're doing that, again, not just because of the environmental, mm -hmm. not just because of the positive press, but in some cases because of the economics okay, of good. that. Uh, and that's an, Im that's an that's important That's a very good, that's uh, yeah, that's a, that does help a lot when and, they can see a profit. In and it certainly or, putting right. a price on carbon, we know mm -hmm. that carbon mm -hmm. has a cost. Mm -hmm. Making sure we get a price on carbon will help improve people's understanding of the economics. Great. Okay. Now I want to talk about a program, uh, your research program, the Energy and Water in a Warming World, the EW3, and people can see this, I believe, on the Union Concerned Scientists uh, website. Uh, can you? What is that project? Sure. Energy and Water Warm in a, in a Warming World, or EW3, is a project we launched in 2009. Before that, water was something. Uh, as we thought about our renewable energy work, the work we do in coal, the work we do to educate people about nuclear. Water was a piece of it, but it, we really felt like it was something that we needed to understand better. When we started looking into it, we realized a lot of people needed to understand it better. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so we did launch EW3, Energy and Water in a Warming World, in 2009 to really raise awareness mm -hmm. uh, about the connection between our energy choices and water, and really the collision as it manifests itself in different ways in different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. So the Southeast and the Southwest and the Northeast and the, mid and, and the Midwest are all dealing with aspects of this and certainly have been, uh, but they manifest themselves in different ways. So what we wanted to do was raise awareness of those, the connection and the collision, and really motivate and inform good choices when it comes to our, the power sector. Let's go, if we go back to thinking about fresh water in general, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I'm, we saw that pie chart where we see that power mm -hmm. plants are a big piece of withdrawals. Mm -hmm. They're a small piece of the consumption pie. That is agriculture. Most of the water that gets withdrawn for agriculture gets consumed. And so agriculture is more than 80% of water, fresh water That's consumption. What they say, yeah. Power plants are about 20% of what's left, so uh, uh, about 3.3% by the, the best figures we have of the overall consumption. So that's a pretty that's a, a small piece. I mean, it adds up to a whole lot of that's right. whole lot of fresh water. But and there are certainly things we can do in agriculture to use oh, water more yes. efficiently <laughs> to improve. Uh, how much water we need to withdraw, yes. how much water we need to consume, what the water quality implications of that are. So there's no question about it. There are things we can do in, in industry. There mm -hmm. are things we can do from the municipal, you know, th thinking mm -hmm. about how mm -hmm. we use water at home. Mm -hmm. Our contention is that the water, the water challenges, water supply and demand are, are so uh, tenuous in mm -hmm. some parts of the country and in many parts of the country at some times of, of the year or in certain circumstances, that we really want to be making smart choices in the ag agricultural mm -hmm, sector, mm -hmm. in the municipal sector, mm -hmm. in the industrial, but also when it comes to power plants. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we focus on it. We also do talk about the water implications of our, of our fuel. You, you think about transportation fuels. We talk about yes, that. Thank that's you. A, that's you... another dimension. Right. But my focus, the focus to, of our project has largely been on power plant water use and mm -hmm. thinking about mm -hmm. the water implications of our of our electricity choices. But before we leave that, I forgot to ask you about that. As a matter of fact, I, you in your materials, you point out that things like ethanol are in fact very extravagant in terms of water. And I don't think we know that, particularly apart from the corn issue. With the, it, it's so impractical. But could you tell us just a little bit about that? The sure, stuff? just in Thank brief, you. you're right. Yes. There are different ways that we're making transportation fuel. Yes. Yes. Uh, most of it that comes we from thought gasoline. we were doing the right thing there and, and changing right. converting to ethanol or right. the, uh, you know trying to drive up the portion that comes from ethanol uh, could have some positive implications we've got to get the carbon equation right but it turns out we also have to get the water equation yes. right because it turns out to use many more times if you think about an irrigated cornfield yeah, that's you know, we're very, irrigating corn right. and then turning that into ethanol, and there's water right, involved right. In, in making the ethanol too. It turns out to be much more water intensive yes. per gallon of fuel yes. or per mile traveled than even gasoline is. So there are things to worry about, uh, things to focus on there. Right. What's clear is that in the power sector, there are these ready alternatives, there are opportunities, there are choices that are economical, that are good from a carbon perspective, and that, mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. have these water implications that are very favorable. Right, but I do want to recommend to people to look on this, look at this material, uh, it's available on the website, and I think this, uh, the, 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 the fuels, for example, like the ethanol issue, I believe that it's under the 10 things you ought to know, uh, and very easy to read PDF form and very, you should download it and take a quick look at it. It's very well done, but uh, it's information all citizens need at this point. We really need to get wise up on this so that we can do our part. And on that, what do we need to know and do as uh, the general public? What would you say is the most important thing for the general public in terms of acting? So two things. The first is to understand the mm -hmm. issues and we do a lot to try to raise awareness. Yes. We are coming out with a, a report next month uh, that looks at sort of the future. So that report I mentioned mm -hmm. looks at where we are now mm -hmm. and how we got there and what it means. Now we're looking uh, 40 years into the future, looking at the next few decades and saying, okay, we have different pathways we can follow in terms of the electricity mixes. 
what do those mean? Why should we care about those? So you look at a business as usual pathway. Mm. What kind of water, what does the water use look like and how should we think about the implications of that? And then you compare that to one say that's heavy on renewable energy that does a lot with energy efficiency. Uh, how, is, how does that look from a, from a carbon perspective certainly, but also from a from a, uh, a cost perspective and from a water perspective. So mm -hmm. water quantities, water quality, uh, ways that that water use could get us into trouble. Mm -hmm. And particularly in the context of climate change. Right, where So if you think vanishing. about <laughs> where water resources in many parts of the country are potentially coming under greater stress, yeah. are gonna be coming under greater stress uh, in terms of their temperature, in terms of their quantities. We're gonna have more water sometimes, less water a lot of times in many parts of the country. Yeah. How do we think about our power plant choices in that context? Right. So that's one thing is thinking about, you know, understand these, right. understanding these issues. And the second thing is realizing that we have a say. Mm -hmm. So power plant decisions are being made by uh, utility companies. They're being made by power plant owners and operators. They're being made by the regulators. But they're also being made, you know, one step removed by legislators. Mm -hmm. What are they saying? How are they driving us away from coal, away from dirty coal, away from water intensive resources, and towards something that's better. What are they doing in terms of driving renewable energy development? How are they promoting energy efficiency? What are they doing about putting a price on carbon? So those are important things. And obviously those legislators are answerable right. to us. To voters, right. To voters, to us. Uh, so we have tremendous opportunities to weigh in, uh, both at the ballot box, Yes. and in hearings at the legislative yes, level, true. hearings yes. at the regulatory level, you know, contacting your utility and saying, what are you doing to avoid, you know, I'm concerned about water use by our power plants. What right. are you doing to minimize that? What are you doing to adapt us to a changing climate? What are you doing to prepare us so that we don't get into the kinds of trouble that we've already seen. Right, and now with the, with the internet, it's so easy to sign petitions, for example, sure. and many organizations create these petitions and people can bring a large voice. You know, people do listen to us in the legislature if you get a good aggregation of voices out there. So that's, that's an important thing. So you're gonna wake us up with the information and then urge us to do our duty as uh, as citizens and, and the global citizen, uh, for that matter. That's right, and Thank it's you. not always easy to get involved. And in, you know, uh, if your public utility commission is, is yes. having a, a, a proceeding around, so you know, you don't necessarily know about that. But if you plug into organizations, yes. regional organizations, national organizations Municipal. like the Union of Concerned right. Scientists, yes. that can Everybody. help you yes. be aware of those opportunities. <laughs> right. Those can, those can really clue you in. And I'll say it's not just regulators at the state level and legislators at the state level. Clearly right. it's Congress, well, it's, absolutely. it's the EPA, yes. it's the Department of Energy. Right. And uh, this was, you know, President Obama's speech was really about taking, you know, he's saying what sort of actions he can take even with, if yes, Congress, if they or don't even act. before Congress gets its act together to do something about right. these issues. Uh, President Obama is gonna do what he can from a regulatory perspective and that's, that's really good. Clearly, Congress needs to take go beyond that. You know, get behind that, and, and then go beyond. And that. then behind Congress, you need the people and to. And we need us behind Congress. Exactly. Saying, we care about these right. issues. Right. I'd so like to, to point do. out, even in little towns like Belmont, there's a sustainable Belmont uh, organization, and you find these popping up all over the place now. And I urge people to, uh, if they can, get involved or at least go to their presentations and stuff. John may be showing up at one of these. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, probably does. And, <laughs> and that's right. And there's a really concrete th thing mm -hmm. that's happening in communities in Massachusetts right now about this solar push. So they're aggregating uh -huh. at the community level. So Arlington has just done this. It's called Solarize Arlington. Medford oh. is just embarking on this. Solarize Medford. I'm sure Belmont is, uh, is not no far idea, behind. I have no idea, but I think that's great. Uh, but where yes. they aggregate, where they get people together and they say, the community goes out and gets a preferred provider and says, here's the cost. Uh -huh. uh, unless you get your you know, ex neighbors into it. And if you do that, we'll drop the cost this much. And if you get more neighbors, we'll drop it this much. Arlington got to tier five pricing, the best pricing, with all the incentives and that kind of pricing, ah. they're getting 
under four year paybacks for solar energy. I That's mean, I fantastic. Think back this is where, very good. I think back to where, where prices were when I started yeah. 20 some years ago in solar energy. Yes, There's been absolutely. tremendous progress in terms of it's scale. It's like the computer chips, it's just uh, That's right. tremendous That's right. progress. And then if you add in movements like right. what Arlington is doing, what Medford right. is embarking right. on, uh, and other communities around the state. Right. They, and, so this is, this is right there in your home. This is your right. rooftop. Taking advantage of the energy efficiency, right. you know, calling your utility and finding out what they have so that you can be using less energy at home. Right, and Tremendous it doesn't take up that much time or anything, but it really, really does doesn't. take the voice of the people to get this going, I'm and sure. And not just the voice, but the pocketbooks of the people. People yes. voting with their wallets and there saying, you go. I right. care about this, I'm doing something about this at home, I want you Le uh, Mr. or Mrs. Legislator, to do something about this. Your I job. Want you in Congress <laughs> yes, to do right. Something yes, about right. This. Well, we have to stop with there so that you can answer questions and so on. Is there any other point you'd like to make quickly? So I just I just like to point out. So on our website there are resources. The yes. Ten things you should know. Everybody should get that. about the energy water collision is one thing. There's another uh, short report called Power and Water at yes. Risk that documents a number of these cases that I've mentioned so that you can really understand why we think this is an issue now or how we know this is an issue now. Right. Uh, there's the report I mentioned, there's the report that will be coming out next month that's future looking. So lots of resources on our right. webpage and not just on our webpage, but lots of resources on the internet that will really help you understand. Yes, and very uh, clearly issues. well written uh, and not six volumes or anything That's like that. Right. They're really good. And the important takeaway is that we have choices, yes. that we're making decisions all the time, and that's utility companies, that's regulators, that's legislators, and that's us. We're making Great. decisions. We can be making decisions that will better prepare us for for the uh, for the, the future of water supply, water quality. Okay, very good. I thank you, and I'm gonna turn this over to the audience, let them go ahead and ask Great. you some questions here. But in the meantime, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Okay. I'm about to show my uh, naivety. Uh, in order to make power, you heat water to make steam. It drives the generator. And then you cool water. And is, what's the point of where, why do you have to put water out that's hotter than what you're drawing in? Is there a, just a point where it's not practical to, with heat, heat exchangers or whatever, to, to almost make it a, a, you come out even? Well, so remember, think back to that diagram I showed in terms of how power plants work. So that uh, work, that process you're talking about. That water is getting cooled and then it's going right back into the boiler and, and getting turned back into steam and going back through that turbine. So that water is just going round and round and, and you don't have to make up that water. It's, the, it's how you cool that steam, how you get it to condense back into, into water quickly so that that turbine operates the way it needs to. That's what you're worried about. So you can, again, you can do that with water or you can do that with air. Cool water is the most efficient, and that's why we often, why so much in, in the past we've used once through cooling, because you pull that water in, it's, it's, it's as cool as it's gonna be, you drive it across those, uh, those heat exchangers, those pipes, and you take away that heat with you. So that's, how, that's one way to do it. The other way is to bring water in, drive it across those pipes, and not let that water go, but bring it back around and drive it across those pipes again and then do it. And you do that, you know, five or seven times before you've used up all that water. And now the facilities that do that so that the temperature of the water they release is much, much lower? So uh, actually, so either, either way you're getting, if you're doing that once through type cooling, that's where you've got huge amounts, huge volumes of water coming in and huge volumes of water going out. That water, when it's going out, has to take that heat with it or if it hasn't done its job. Now, there are things, this, you know, it's very interesting that you ask this because there are things you can do to cool that water some on the downstream side. And they, there are power plants that have that. It's sort of jury rigged. You know, you're, they're, they end up evaporating some of it to cool it down before they dump it or they mix it so they don't. But any way you slice it, you're having implications on how much water is going back in at, at what temperature. So anytime you're using water, you've got implications and they have. And we don't necessarily say which is better, which type of cooling, which technologies are 
better. It really, it does depend on local circumstances. Most of the time, drawing in, you know, a billion gallons of water a day probably isn't great for your local, your local ecosystem, you know, your local water, water resource. Um, I'm uh, questioning about uh, the development of solar cells because I've been reading the potential of some sort of uh, polymerization or carbon nanotube, whatever, uh, redesign of solar cells. What can you say about that? It's supposed to be infinitely cheaper. Uh, that would be great. Uh, and uh, we focus a lot on the technologies that are already commercially available and we work to create, try to, at the Union of Concerned Scientists, we try to create policy environments to drive that kind of innovation. We know that if we're sending clear signals about uh, uh, our, our interest in energy independence, yeah. our interest in fuel diversification, our interest in reducing environmental costs of energy, including carbon pollution, if we're telling industry and academia that we care about those things, and we're telling that clearly and consistently. We know that you know American ingenuity being what it is, and innovation, our history of innovation, that kind of stuff is gonna happen. Not all those technologies will make it, but if we create the environment that says, you know, uh, we care about that, we care about that innovation, we want it to come, let's do it, then uh, we can help uh, make that sort of thing happen. I will say there's tremendous potential for uh, continuous improvements in solar energy. Some of those, most of the, uh, most of what I've seen in my 20 plus years in solar has been incremental, sort of evolutionary, but that doesn't mean that revolution can't happen. Uh, it, a lot of times it's a scale issue, you know, just how do we get more and more produced uh, so that we drive, you know, we get the economies of scale, we drive down the cost. Hi. Uh, first, just wanted to thank you and the rest of the Union Concerned Scientists for what you're doing to, to enlighten the public on this very important issue. Uh, I think it's something that the, the public generally doesn't uh, have enough background about. It's quite important. Um, my question is, you know, we're already seeing and can certainly anticipate a lot more pushback uh, on some of Obama's plans with um, decarbonizing the, the power plants and so forth. Um, you know, we've got the fossil fuel industry and their lobbyists pushing back pretty heavily, and that's only going to continue. But you've got, you know, some big sectors of, of the U.S., um, geographic sectors, I'm thinking of, you know, the South and even the Midwest that <clears throat> are really coming up pretty close on this energy water nexus. Uh, I heard, I think, last year uh, there was a, a couple power plants in Texas that were very close to having to shut down. Um, are you aware of any organizations that are really doing, you know, concentrating on those, those areas of the country to, to really bring them up to speed on that? Well, I'll say uh, this is an issue across the country. So we documented cases last summer. Again, with 60% of the country in drought, you had incidents in, the, in the, uh, the, the Midwest, you had it in the Northeast. I mean, power plants in the Northeast that were getting into trouble because of their water use. There's a lot going on in lots of parts of the country. And in terms of the transition, remember, uh, the, economy, the, the economics are doing a lot of what we hoped uh, to drive with education and regulation. That is coal plants, and we've documented this as well, tens of thousands of plants being announced for shutdown. Uh, that's going to have tremendous water implications right there. But also, uh, there, there's a lot, a lot of great things that are going on. So uh, don't despair. Uh, there's a lot we can do. There's a lot we are doing. There's a lot that is happening. There's a lot more that needs to happen but we have choices and, and, and we can make those. Thank you very much. I began working in renewable energy in the early 1990s. I was working as a Peace Corps volunteer in Central America where there was a tremendous need for electricity in rural areas. At the time, the solar solar markets were very much in developing countries. That has changed a lot. So I worked for 15 years in developing countries. In 2006, I joined the Union of Concerned Scientists to work on renewable energy in the United States. 
and solar energy and other renewable energy uh, has very much uh, focused since then on, uh, on many countries in the world, including the United States. So I'm a, I'm a mechanical engineer, uh, master's in mechanical engineering, uh, but my undergraduate degree, degree was in Latin American history. So I, had, uh, I was uh, pursuing a technical course and discovered that history was a, was a, a more general, more convenient major. Uh, so I had a, a technical, uh, some, some technical knowledge, but it was after I had started working in solar energy that uh, I went back for a, a graduate degree in, in mechanical engineering to really beef up the, the technical aspects. The work is very much a mixture of the technical, the analytical, but also the, the, the people and the communication aspects of it. And so uh, my background, I think, prepared me well for, for the, the range of uh, activities that I'm engaged in at this point. What I find most rewarding about what I do now is really uh, having the chance to talk with people, get, enter into discussions about topics that are really important for the United States and for the, country, and for the world, uh, climate change and energy, and particularly renewable energy, and thinking about the choices we have and the choices we're making and what the implications of those are. So what's challenging sometimes is uh, is communicating with a broad enough audience. There are a lot of people who understand the science, understand the science of climate change, who understand the role that renewable energy can play in our, in our energy, in, in providing electricity for us, uh, that understand the challenges of the way we've done, uh, we've traditionally generated electricity and used it. Uh, so the challenges are, are broadening that understanding and that's what we work a lot to do. So when it comes to energy and water and climate change, what we really try to communicate around the power sector is the choices that we have when it comes to making electricity and using electricity and the implications of those choices, both the ones we've made in the past that are influencing now how much water, for example, we use to generate electricity and the choices we're making now that will determine how well prepared we are for a future, a future where climate change uh, is continuing, where water is hotter, where temperatures are hotter, where water might be more scarce, and thinking about whether we're making the right choices, the best choices for, uh, in, in terms of how we generate electricity.